Welcome to the Bowers Museum. I'm Lynn Liu, and I'll be guiding you through a virtual highlights tour of Spirits and Headhunters, Art of the Pacific Islands. Keep in mind, there's much more to see in this exhibition, and we hope that you will join us on site soon to explore the gallery in its entirety. While you're here, you'll also discover eight other permanent collection galleries and our current featured exhibitions, which are created in partnership with world-class institutions from around the globe. Visit Bowers.org for tickets and more information to start planning your trip today. The vast region of Oceania in the Pacific Ocean is home to thousands of scattered islands, generally grouped into the cultural regions of Melanesia, Micronesia, and Polynesia. The total land area of the islands is small relative to the almost 40 million square miles of water that both separates and connects them. Humans migrated to the Pacific Islands in two principal waves. Archaeological evidence shows that at least 40,000 years ago, the inhabitants of Southeast Asia arrived in New Guinea, Australia, and the neighboring archipelagos, most likely by crossing land bridges that were present during the Ice Age and island hopping with simple rafts. Around 1500 BCE, a culture we now call the Lapita joined from a new wave of Southeast Asian migrants and the inhabitants of Melanesia, who had spent millennia adapting to the region. The Lapita used large, double-holed canoes and the art of wayfinding, studying cloud formations, prevailing winds, the flight patterns of birds, and the night sky, to traverse thousands of miles of open ocean. By dating the distinctively geometrically incised pottery that the Lapita created with various techniques, experts have been able to retrace their dispersal to increasingly remote islands of Micronesia and Polynesia. Over time, their culture developed into those still populating the Pacific Islands to this day, and their descendants ultimately settled as far east as Easter Island, bringing with them their customs, traditions, agriculture, livestock, and aesthetic preferences. Spirits and Headhunters, Art of the Pacific Islands, introduces visitors to the three great divisions of the Pacific Islands through their cultures and works of art. In this exhibition, one sees that oceanic rituals and traditions speak to universal human themes, all the while remaining dependent on materials that are locally available or tradable. Let's start with Melanesia, the first region of Oceania that was settled. It is a geographically complex area with the greatest cultural diversity among the Pacific Islands. Its largest island, New Guinea, is home to over 800 indigenous languages, more than one-tenth of those spoken around the world. Melanesia also includes some Indonesian islands to the west of New Guinea, Norfolk Island to the south, and all the islands west of the Fijian archipelago, which itself is culturally Melanesian. Every aspect of life in Melanesia is generally more varied than the rest of the Pacific, largely because the environment is so much more diverse. The oldest objects in spirits and headhunters are stone, and hail back to the earliest inhabitants of Melanesia, growing in specialization over time with the evolution of practices like agriculture and hunting. Ceremonial objects like this effigy of an animal, an echidna, that might be hundreds or thousands of years old, are rediscovered with some frequency, especially during construction or from tilling soil, and are used or instilled with a newfound spiritual significance. Though pecked stone is difficult to date, archaeologists have been able to determine that similar effigies were made up to 3,500 years ago by carbon dating pieces of organic material trapped in their cracks. Factors like limited food, high rates of disease, and constant battles over land made traditional life through Melanesia uncertain at the best of times. In an effort to control these unknowns and improve their lives, the peoples of New Guinea often turned to gods, spirits of the forest, and their own ancestors. Every village found a unique balance between the physical and spiritual worlds, using belief systems and ritual objects developed over thousands of generations to influence outcomes for the better. The art of New Guinea is evidenced of the evolution of one of the richest animistic belief systems in the world. Traditionally, magic bags like this one, covered in charred animal bones, were used by powerful men. Sorcerers are healers to hold talismans, stones, bits of bark or cloth, 
mosses, and ancestor bones. All the objects one needed to commune with good and evil spirits and supernaturally carry out their will. Before warfare was officially outlawed in the mid-20th century, it was a part of daily life in New Guinea. Both the location and times of battles were scheduled, and the ensuing hostilities could often go on for months, culminating in someone being hurt or killed in battle. Once all parties agreed that a fair battle had taken place and reparations were settled, usually in the form of pigs given to the family of the deceased, life would go on until another issue arose. Bows and arrows, spears, shields, and clubs of all shapes and sizes were employed in battles. Feasts are the premier social gatherings in New Guinea. These village-wide or multi-village events once marked the end of battle and are still used to commemorate the passing of elders or celebrate marriages. The day of the feast, the host provides as many pigs as he can afford to ensure his social status for years to come. The pigs are ritually killed and then roasted in a rock pit for hours. Eventually, they are served along with other oceanic staples like taro and sago. A bowl this size would be extraneous on any occasion but that of a communal feast. More so, this is among the largest bowls to come from the Admiralty Islands. Its body is made from a single piece of wood and its decorative handles are carved separately and attached to a paste made from local nuts. Marriage, one of the principal occasions for feasting, was rarely motivated by love in customary Melanesian cultures. A good relationship with one's neighboring villages was key to survival, making marriage a valuable currency of peace. Just as was the case with European monarchs, women were often married off to create calculated alliances. This was so pervasive that in many parts of New Guinea, it was forbidden to marry someone from your own village. Elaborate negotiations would take place until families and villages as a whole felt there was a fair exchange. Pigs, a crucial currency of exchange, were at the center of most bride price negotiations, along with highly ornate status objects like greenstone adze heads, feathered sticks and rolls, and shell monies like this large ring of Nasa shells. For the cultures of the Pacific, and especially New Guinea, adornment plays an important role in helping define each person's social status and cultural identity. Shell, bone, teeth, seeds, wood, feathers, fur, and more are used in ornaments that people wear while carrying out their daily chores. During festivals, weddings, funerals, and the special events that surround mask dances and festivals, individuals wear their finest ensembles, covering their bodies in coconut oil or body paints, and donning accessories made with treasured bird of paradise feathers and prized shells that have been passed down for generations. This adornment was made with a hornbill beak and pig tusks to be worn on the back of a male warrior. The hornbill is important to the people of the New Guinea Highlands. In addition to its beak, it is hunted for its feathers, which are used alongside bird of paradise and cassowary feathers on many styles of Papuan ornaments. Throughout modern day Melanesia, masks continue to be important icons of tribal culture and spirituality. Most exist like other ritual objects as a medium for communicating with spirits. One of the more spectacular displays of ritual and dance in the oceanic subregion takes place in the mountains of the Gazelle Peninsula on the east end of the island of New Britain. The Baining Fire Dance can celebrate a childbirth, the start of the harvest, or the recently deceased, and is a rite of passage for young men ascending to adulthood. Male dancers wear enormous but lightweight masks made from bamboo frames and white bark cloth. They take turns racing through the central bonfire, kicking up embers and dancing until the arrival of dawn. Vanuatu, a series of islands that are located a little over a thousand miles southeast of New Guinea, is home to some exceptional examples of monumental sculpture from the Pacific Islands. Slick gongs are instruments that are made from hollowed out trees. The deep, resonating sounds they create when struck are seen as messages from ancestors and sacred spirits. 
played upright by one or more drummers, the very tones of these instruments can hold ceremonial meanings, signal important events, or serve as messages to neighboring villages. Large grade figures were carved to honor ancestors. Made from the trunks of fernwood trees and covered with mud plaster and pigments, the figures were often erected near the men's house in conjunction with celebrations marking an individual's elevation to a new rank or status. The large head symbolizes the ancestor's spiritual power, or mana. Turning now away from Melanesia, we look to the next region that was peopled during the Pacific Migration. Micronesia, which is Greek for small islands, is made up of more than 2,500 islands found between Palau in the west, Wake Island in the northeast, and the island chain of Kiribati in the southeast. Despite there being so many islands, it contains just a little more than 1 400th of the total land area of Melanesia. Micronesia's people are renowned for their navigational skills. Though rich in culture today, the harsh realities of their home, devastating storms and relatively scarce wood and stone resources, forced Micronesians to focus on sustaining life rather than creating highly decorative objects. Material objects are rarer than those found elsewhere in the Pacific Islands, and great emphasis is placed on simplicity of form. There are of course exceptions to the characteristically simple elegance of Micronesian design, one of which is the coconut fiber armor, porcupine fish helmets, and shark tooth swords of Kiribati. The archipelago has a long history of war, and its unique armor was likely developed in response to its arms to minimize the potentially life-threatening wounds caused by razor-sharp shark teeth. The last of Oceania's regions is Polynesia. Of the three, it is by far the largest in area, encompassing over 10 million square miles of the Pacific Ocean. It can be subdivided into Western Polynesia, which includes Tonga, Samoa, Fiji, and other relatively close islands, and Eastern Polynesia, which is bounded by Easter Island near South America, Hawaii in the north, and New Zealand in the southwest, and includes important archipelagos like the Marquesas Islands. Polynesia represents a conglomeration of cultures with different languages and different belief systems. Unlike the other defining regions of the Pacific, royalty and noble birth define the social order, allowing fate to be decided by people instead of the unseen forces of the spiritual world. New Zealand was the last major archipelago settled as part of Pacific migration. As such, the art of its Maori people bears similarities to wood carvings of eastern Polynesia. Maori carvings are mostly distinguished by their intricate incised designs and mother-of-pearl inlay. This paddle was expertly carved by Anaha Te Rahui, a renowned Maori leader and carver. Later in life, the artist began to experiment and innovate with traditional forms. The figure at the top of the paddle's shaft is a female carved in the style of traditional house gable masks. Such figures are usually male, so the female depiction coupled with its dynamic stance make this paddle quite special. We hope that you enjoyed our virtual tour of Spirits and Headhunters, Art of the Pacific Islands. For more on the subject, please consider visiting Bowers Museum in person or participating in one of our many exhibition-related programs. Details for events and how to plan your visit can be found at bowers.org. Thank you, as always, for your support.